Hi everyone, this is Miss Rose. Today we're going to cover the C section of notes on reproduction of flowering plants. So how these plants that have flowers will reproduce. Right here you're looking at an orchid flower and what's interesting about this guy is that it has this lower part of the flower itself, a little specialized petal that acts as a landing point for pollinators. All right, you guys have this diagram in your notes on page 11, so make sure you fill in all of the diagram of the flower. Flowers contain all of the reproductive organs of a, of a plant, and they are protected by specialized leaves near the bottom. They are called sepals. So this guy right here, and this one is a sepal. The sepals actually protect that flower before it blooms open. So when you see a bud, um, it's generally green and not the same color as the petals, and that's because it's the sepal that you're looking at, not the petals that would be inside. Different types of flowers have different sepals though. Some look like petals and are very similar in color, but others are just green. So moving on to petals, petals are brightly colored to attract animal pollinators. That's also why flowers will have a scent to them to attract those pollinators as well. Most flowers have male and female parts, like the one you're looking at in this diagram. Some have one or the other. For our purposes, we're gonna focus on the flowers that have both male and female parts. Starting with the male parts of this flower. The male part is called the stamen. That's easy to remember because it actually has the word men in it. There are four stamens in this diagram. Here's one of them. It's made up of two parts. The filament is this stalk that supports the anther. And the anther is the top part. It produces pollen grains, which are the male gamete. Since we will be talking about gametes, remember back to meiosis when we learned about human gametes. Gametes are haploid. They contain half the number of chromosomes that a normal body cell will have. So that upon fertilization, when the sperm cell meets the egg cell, we get the full number in our growing zygote. The same is true of flowers. They will have a male gamete and a female gamete that will become fertilized when they meet and produce a fertilized egg, which is called a zygote. The female part of the flower is called the carpal, and it usually sticks up taller than the stamens, and there's only one of them. There may be many stamens, but there's only going to be one carpal. Sometimes the carpal is also called a pistil. You may or may not see that term, but it's interchangeable. The carpal is made up of three structures. The entire carpal is this. At the very top, this is the stigma, and it's sticky. Think sticky stigma. It's sticky for a purpose, so that pollen will attach here, and the um, pollen will move down this tube, which is called the style, until it reaches an ovule within the ovary at the base of this structure. Ovules are the female gametes. They will go on to um, produce an egg, which can be fertilized. Now, when this gets fertilized, the ovary will go on to become a fruit, and the ovules will go on to become the seeds of the fruit. Now, all flowering plants do produce fruits. That doesn't mean that you want to eat some of those fruits. Some are edible, some are not. If this is a fruit that is edible, say it's a flower on a, an apple tree, then the ovary down here will become the apple, the fleshy part of the apple that you eat, and the ovules will become the seeds. This is a hibiscus flower. I wanted to quickly show you this because the stamen and the carpal look a little bit different than our diagram. This entire thing right here is the carpal, and it extends down into the base of the flower where the ovary is, containing the ovules. And then the stamens, instead of coming out here, like we see in our diagram, they're actually coming off of this structure. So each of these little stalks is the filament, and then each of these are anthers. All right, we're at the top of page 12. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about how fertilization occurs in a flowering plant. And I might switch between saying fertilization and pollination. Really, when we're talking about plants with flowers, you can use those terms interchangeably. So the male gamete is the pollen grain, and it's produced in the anthers. The cell in the male um, part of the flower that goes on to make pollen grains is first called a spore, 
and it divides by mitosis to produce that pollen grain with two haploid cells within it. So that pollen grain, that haploid gamete, actually has two haploid cells within it. If we were to compare it to um, human sperm cells, it'd be like two sperm cells fused together. And the significance of that, why we're talking about it, is one of those haploid cells goes on to fertilize the egg within the ovule, and the other one goes on to become something called endosperm. And endosperm will go on to be food for the developing embryo. This entire thing is surrounded by a thick wall, which is just protection for those sperm cells within this structure. The female gamete is each ovule in a flower's ovary, and one of those cells in the ovary will develop into an egg, which can become fertilized. All right, we're going to talk about pollination in a little more detail. Pollination will begin when a pollen grain lands on that sticky stigma. All right, here are those male spores that divide by mitosis to make the male gamete, the pollen grain, here, with those two haploid sperm inside. That pollen grain will land on the sticky stigma of the carpal, and it's going to grow a pollen tube down the style until it reaches the ovules in the ovary. So we're actually using the term pollen tube for the style in this case. It means the same thing. In this picture, we see the actual fertilization of the egg cell meeting the sperm cell. And here is that extra sperm cell. It goes on to become endosperm, that will feed our new, newly formed zygote, which is a fertilized egg. That zygote goes on to become an embryo, tiny little plant in there, and it's surrounded by a seed coat to protect it. When that embryo gets large enough, it will germinate and break out of that seed coat, like you see here. After fertilization, each ovule will become a seed, and while the seed develops, the surrounding ovary grows into a fruit. So this papaya here has got a ton of seeds. That means the flower would have had a ton of ovules inside of the ovary. And then the fruit itself is the mature ovary of a flowering plant. Weird thought, but you're eating an ovary when you eat fruit. Now, like I mentioned earlier, all of these flowering plants do produce fruits, but they're not all edible like this papaya. Some of them you wouldn't dare eat. Like think of a dandelion. Each of those little um, parts of the dandelion that fly off that look like this. Dandelion is made up of a ton of these. This is the fruit. You wouldn't eat that, nor would it be any good to eat. But botanists or scientists that study uh, flowers and plants will refer to anything like this as a fruit. This is the structure of each of those seeds that are inside the ovary now, inside of the fruit. The seed will contain a plant embryo, which will develop into a mature plant. Make sure to label your diagram with these three labels. So we have the plant embryo in green here, and then the endosperm, which is what's going to feed that embryo as it grows. And then the entire thing is surrounded by a seed coat, which is a protective covering. Now these seeds are meant to be spread. They don't want to just fall right underneath the parent plant and grow a new plant there. There simply wouldn't be enough resources to sustain both of those, especially after lots of generations. So seeds are meant to be dispersed, and there's a couple different ways that that can happen. First one is by animals. That ovary develops into a fruit for a reason. They're meant to attract animals who would ingest that fruit and also ingest some seeds in the process. That seed coat is very protective, so it can go all the way through an animal's digestive system. And as the animal goes about its business, it can poop it out and then a new plant will grow there. Another adaptation that these seeds have is to cling. They can cling to fur like this poor guy right here who has these stickers in his fur. Those are seeds. They're meant to cling so that this animal can go about its business again and drop some of those in different locations. Seeds can also be dispersed by wind and can have parachute or wing-like fruits. These little structures are actually considered the fruit of the dandelion. I wouldn't eat any if, if I were you, 
Um, probably not very good or good for you, but these guys are specially adapted to take off with the wind and actually fly through the air. Similarly, this is commonly called a helicopter seed. It comes from maple trees and there are other trees that produce these types of seeds with these sort of wing-like structures. They spin around like a little helicopter and take flight and can get pretty far away from the original parent. Seeds can also be dispersed by water or have fruits that float. So a coconut is a seed and it's buoyant for a reason so that it can float to different islands. From there, it would just need to be watered pretty regularly and after about three to six months, it'll start sprouting a plant. I've been using the term sprout a lot, but really when a seed begins to grow out of its seed coat, that's called germination. This picture is showing germination take place. You can even see the little seed coat drop off of this as the little seedling uh, comes out of the soil. What's really cool is those seed coats are so protective that it's the seed can actually stay dormant for quite a while until it sprouts. It's only going to grow when environmental conditions are favorable. That's why gardeners can have a packet of seeds. They don't plant that season. They can save them until the next year and they're perfectly fine. Once that seed starts to get some water and realizes that the conditions are favorable for it, it'll start to germinate and break out of its seed coat. 